She could do it. She was independent. She was strong. And she was. She was going to get her point across to the whole community that she could do this and she didn't need help from anybody else. And, and she, you know what? She didn't. But in a way, that might have been part of her downfall. I remember her laugh. I would, without hesitation, describe her as Lauren Bacall's younger, prettier sister. But Betty was even prettier than that. She had a career. The other moms didn't. And if she wanted to do something, she did. She wore hand-me-downs, and yet she looked like a million bucks. She had a style. It was more than just physical beauty. She really was a, she was a pretty woman, but she was a nice woman. It's just, it was unbelievable. She was really nice. This is my mother, Betty, as she lives in my mind's eye. This picture was taken in 1990. She was 44 years old. This is my mother 10 years later, in 2000, when she was arrested for drunk driving. She was 54. And this is my mother in 2007, when she was arrested again. She was 61. Five months later, she died of alcoholism. As I've tried to come to terms with my mother's disease and death, I've wondered, what did alcohol do to her body, mind, and spirit? Why did she start drinking? Why didn't she stop? How typical was her story? And who was my mother, other than an alcoholic? My husband and I were on our 10th anniversary. Uh, we were away overnight. We're taking a walk through this campus where we got married, and my phone rang. It said restricted number, and it was the police. They said, Sherry, and they had been in touch with me over the summer. Your mother's mail's piled up for a week, and um, the water company went over this morning to turn off her water for non-payment, and the plumber um, got sick. There was a really terrible smell, and we need to... Does she still live there? And I said, yeah. And they said, is she home? I said, I don't know. And they said, we have to break in. I told the lieutenant to expect deplorable conditions inside the house. My mother had not let anyone inside for more than 16 years, and there were signs of serious trouble. Over the summer, she had been summoned to housing court by the Board of Health for rotting food left on her front porch and foul-smelling waste dumped in her backyard. I could tell just from how she smelled and how the house smelled that um, this was a bad situation, you know? And I didn't know what was ahead. And I just, I felt so badly for her. And I just wanted to do what I could, but she wouldn't, you know, she was just so ashamed. The police had already prepared for the worst. They knew my mother as a chronic alcoholic and a recluse and were aware of her citations from the Board of Health. The lieutenant said he'd call back to let me know what the officers found. While I waited, I thought about the past. After a four-year estrangement from me, Mom had called back in April. She had been arrested on driving-related charges and asked me to take her to court. We had remained in contact since then, but on her terms. She made and answered calls when she felt like it. Sometimes weeks passed between conversations. Although it was obvious to everyone that my mother badly needed help, she refused to accept it. She was mentally oriented, so no one could impose help upon her. She had the legal right to live or to die as she chose. I don't remember ever running into her. Um, never at the store, the grocery store. Never seeing her on the street. Not at your grandmother's funeral. No place. But she didn't want me to help her. 
So even though there were people that would have been able to help or would have wanted to, she had a hard time accepting that. I just feel bad that she had isolated herself at the end. We all watched helplessly, ready and eager to reach out. If only she would let us. And then when they called and said, yeah, you know, she's gone. And um, when's the last time you talked to her? And I said, oh, nine days ago. They said, well, she must have died around that time. And I just felt so awful that she was dead and I couldn't even tell she was dead. You know, I just thought I'd be able to feel it. There were more shocks to come. Her body was so badly decomposed that it had to be taken to the medical examiner's office in Boston for forensic identification. Did she have tattoos? Did she have any screws or plates in her body that would show up on x-ray? Was she missing any organs? Oh, I don't bother filling that out. There's not enough left for us to tell what organs she has and doesn't. Dental records were not conclusive because she had lost many teeth since she had last seen a dentist. Finally, the medical examiner located an x-ray that showed a spinal fracture, and it matched an x-ray taken of her remains. Her body was positively identified and released for cremation. And she just, she wanted to die. She said to me, I, I'll be so relieved when it's all over. And she did die. Alcohol had been destroying mom for decades. And by the time anyone realized it, it was really just too late. Over time, alcoholism damages every system, organ, and tissue in the body. Although alcoholics of both sexes suffer medical problems, they appear sooner and escalate faster in women than men because of biological differences. Women's bodies are smaller, contain more fat and less water, and produce different hormones and enzymes than men's. As a result, women metabolize alcohol more slowly, so its toxins remain in their bodies longer and do greater damage. Alcoholic women's death rate is 50 to 100% higher than alcoholic men's. The gastrointestinal system is one of the first affected by drinking, especially in women. Alcohol irritates the esophagus, stomach, and intestines, causing heartburn, gas, bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. Irritation can also lead to painful lesions, internal bleeding, and even fatal hemorrhaging. Eventually, an alcoholic's body cannot extract crucial nutrients, vitamins, and minerals from food. Advanced-aged alcoholics develop some of the same nutrition-related conditions as people dying from starvation. My mother was typical. From the time I was small, she complained of heartburn and took antacids every day. For decades, she had irritable bowel syndrome. In her final months, she could barely digest any food at all. She usually vomited or had diarrhea shortly after eating. She grew painfully thin and listless. The reproductive system is also quickly affected by drinking. Women who drink even moderately can develop menstrual disorders, including irregular cycles, heavy flow, and severe cramping. Drinking suppresses ovulation and hormone production making it more difficult to get pregnant and increasing the odds of miscarriage and birth defects. Mom also experienced menstrual problems early on. Her periods came so frequently, her bleeding was so heavy, and her cramps so severe that she had a hysterectomy at the age of 34. The endocrine and exocrine glands produce hormones that control essential bodily processes, the thyroid and parathyroid regulate heart function in the body's use of calcium. 
An underactive thyroid leads to weight gain, lack of energy, poor memory, and even brittle bones. The hypothalamus regulates sleep, blood pressure, heart rate, and body temperature. Poor hypothalamic function causes insomnia, high blood pressure, and chronic chilliness. The hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands form the HPA axis, which controls the body's reaction to stress. In alcoholics, the HPA axis produces too much of the stress hormone cortisol, which leads to psychological problems and also to physical disorders. My mother suffered almost every one of these endocrine and exocrine related disorders. By the age of 30, she had chronic insomnia and had become addicted to sleeping pills. By 35, she had an underactive thyroid. By 40, she had high blood pressure. She suffered depression for decades and in the last years of her life had frequent panic attacks. She also developed Cushing's syndrome. Her once beautiful face grew bloated and her thick curly hair went limp and started to fall out. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women, especially African-Americans. And alcoholic women develop heart damage much sooner and after less exposure to alcohol than men. Many alcoholics develop serious heart conditions. The heart can enlarge and beat sluggishly and fluid can build up around it. Many alcoholics die of heart attacks and congestive heart failure. Alcohol also damages the blood vessels, causing them to harden and accumulate plaque. This constricts blood flow and leads to high blood pressure and stroke. Even the blood itself is affected by drinking. In alcoholics, red blood cells swell and become sludgy. They can clump together and block small blood vessels, impeding the delivery of oxygen to organs and tissues, causing them to die. Mom also suffered cardiac and circulatory problems as a result of drinking. In addition to high blood pressure, she had an irregular heartbeat and complained of chest pain. It's likely that she died of a heart attack or a stroke. Even the lungs are affected by drinking. Because alcoholics frequently inhale food and vomit, they develop more lung infections, including pneumonia, than non-alcoholics. Alcoholics also produce less of a protein that prevents fluid buildup in the lungs. They suffer double to triple the rate of acute respiratory distress syndrome as non-alcoholics, especially if they also smoke. Again, mom proved typical. She drank for more than 35 years and smoked for more than 40. She had a hacking cough for as long as I can remember. Approximately two years before she died, she was diagnosed with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, an incurable and often fatal lung disease. The liver is one of the body's most important organs. It filters toxins from the blood and produces bile and enzymes that aid digestion. As most people know, alcohol is extremely toxic to the liver. An alcoholic's liver quickly becomes fatty and operates less efficiently. Over time, the liver tissue inflames, scars, and dies. Women also suffer liver damage much sooner than men. Liver failure is fatal and is one of the leading causes of alcoholic women's high death rate. At the age of 39, my mother learned that she had already suffered permanent liver damage from drinking and her abdomen grew bloated as her liver lost the ability to process fluid and it collected inside of her. The kidneys produce enzymes that regulate blood pressure and hormones that regulate the production of blood cells. With the liver, they also filter toxins from the blood. Alcohol suppresses enzyme and hormone production and damages kidney tissue. Severe damage causes kidney failure, which is also fatal. My mother was susceptible to urinary tract infections, which might indicate that her kidney function was weakened by her drinking. In one of our final conversations, 
She told me that for several weeks, her urine had been pink, a sign that she was passing blood. She may have had a chronic kidney infection, or her overworked, damaged kidneys may have been failing and breaking down. The toxins in alcohol attack muscle tissue, causing it to atrophy or waste away. My mother was once a strong woman, but in her final months, she was so weak that when I took her to court or an appointment, I had to help her get in and out of the car and go up and down steps. She used a cane, but was still shaky on her feet. An advanced alcoholic cannot absorb nutrients like calcium and vitamin D that are required to make and maintain healthy bone. Alcoholic women lose up to half of their bone mass and frequently develop osteoporosis. Their bones become porous and brittle and break easily. Alcoholic women suffer far more broken bones than non-alcoholics, especially of the hip and vertebrae. Both types of breaks are extremely painful and debilitating. Approximately four years before she died, my mother fell at home and severely fractured her spine. The fracture left her in constant, excruciating pain. Even simple tasks like bathing, dressing, preparing meals, and cleaning up became almost impossible for her. The central nervous system includes the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Among its many functions, the nervous system controls movement, balance, and coordination. Alcohol is toxic to the nervous system. As anyone who's been drunk knows, too much alcohol disturbs balance and coordination. In chronic alcoholics, these disturbances become permanent and irreversible. By the summer of 2007, my mother's nervous system was severely damaged. Her sense of balance was poor and she walked with a shuffle. She wore slacks and long sleeves even in stifling weather to hide the severe bruises that covered her body from bumping into things and falling down. Nerves also carry information between the brain and the sensory organs and structures of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. Over time, all of the senses deteriorate. With sight, focus blurs, colors appear dull, and peripheral vision narrows. With hearing, sounds seem muffled and their origin is unclear. Smell and taste also fade, making it difficult to tell if food has gone bad. Before she died, mom complained that there was something wrong with her eyes. Without warning, her vision would go out of focus so badly that she could not read newsprint or street signs. In court, she could not make out what the judge and attorney said and asked me to repeat it. Worst of all, she left meat that she had ordered from television on her front porch for so long that it rotted. Her neighbors complained to authorities about the nauseating smell, but she herself could not detect it. She probably ate spoiled food regularly and made herself sick. Alcoholism also causes severe brain damage. Like heart and liver damage, brain damage begins sooner and progresses faster in women than men. As these MRIs show, the gray matter in an alcoholic's brain shrinks in volume and the ventricles, or empty spaces, enlarge. Over time, alcohol-induced brain damage can cause confusion, memory loss, personality changes, depression and anxiety, delusions and hallucinations, irreversible dementia, and seizures and strokes. Like all advanced alcoholics, my mother also suffered alcohol-induced brain damage. By the time she died, the damage was profound. She was paralyzed by depression and panic attacks. She also likely met the criteria for Diogenes syndrome, a severe mental health disorder marked by extreme self-neglect and squalor. She put off seeing the doctor until he refused to renew her prescriptions unless she came in. In the last year of her life, she did not see the doctor at all, 
and probably ran out of medication altogether, hastening her death. In time, she wouldn't go anywhere except to the liquor store. She also refused to let anyone inside of her house, even when her stove and refrigerator broke and her only toilet backed up. She stopped putting out trash and even bagging it. We suspect that she did not hire repairmen and plumbers out of shame and also fear of being reported to the authorities. I went in her house before you did. And they had cleaned out most of the trash, uh, most of the furnishings. And it was still so filthy and it stunk and it felt like an animal's death. Mom's squalor was so severe that it had to be cleaned up by a biohazard crew. It took them almost three weeks. For the first, they could not enter the house without full protective gear. The odors of garbage, animal waste, human waste, and decomposition permeated everything so thoroughly that the crew could salvage only a few trinkets and photographs, and even they had to be treated with ozone, a potent odor remover, for days before being given to us. The new owners of the house gutted it to the outer walls. No one can predict exactly who will become an alcoholic, but there are several known risk factors. It turns out that my mother had most of them. Both environment and genetics contribute to alcoholism. Genetics seem to have a stronger influence on women than men and may account for as much as 60% of a woman's risk. Although my mother's parents did not drink, at least one of her grandparents did. Her maternal grandmother, Agnes, who emigrated from Scotland in 1912 to escape poverty. Agnes was a tippler, as drinkers were called in her day. She never lost a job, custody of her children, or the ability to care for herself because of drinking, but she regularly drank until she passed out. Family problems, especially abuse, can also contribute to alcoholism. In one study, nearly 70% of the women in treatment for drinking reported being sexually abused as children, double the percentage in the general population. Physical and emotional abuse also increase the risk. Even without abuse, troubled family relationships are associated with women's drinking, especially when the trouble lies between mother and daughter. In this, too, my mother's family proved typical. My grandmother, Elsie, was born deaf and received state funding to attend Clark School for the Deaf in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she learned to lip read and speak. Although her own family was poor, at Clark School, where she was a boarding student, Elsie mingled with higher society and acquired a taste for fashion and fine things. She developed a lifelong passion for shopping and had closets full of stylish clothing that she could not afford. My grandfather, Richard, was born with a severely constricted airway and was given a permanent tracheotomy to save his life. The procedure was unusual and risky on a child. He had to be monitored closely and spent much of his youth at Boston Children's Hospital. As a result, his anxious parents spoiled him. My grandparents were good-hearted people who genuinely loved each other. But given their histories as indulged children who lived away from home, they were largely unprepared for the realities of marriage and parenthood. My grandfather worked as a machinist and eventually, my grandmother also took a job. But given their lavish spending habits, they argued about money, could not keep up with their bills, and were always in debt. Mom was close to her father, but had a difficult relationship at best with her mother. 
we both had chores to do around the house. Both families were fairly religious. Um, church every Sunday, and we were just basically taught good manners. We were taught how to be polite. Her stories were about how strict Grandma was. Grandma made her do this, and Grandma made her do that, and she had to dress very proper and look very proper. Mom was expected to do a lot of chores. She did a lot of heavy cleaning. She took care of her younger brother and sister a lot. She found refuge at Agnes's farm. Her beloved uncle and auntie also lived there, and she loved them like parents all of her life. Despite her family problems, my mother seems to have had a fairly typical childhood and adolescence. She was active in her church youth group and had close friends. She earned her driver's license, attended her prom, and graduated from high school. Yet, my mother and all of her siblings left home by the age of 18. Only one of the four remained close to both of her parents, and three of the four abused alcohol or drugs. It's difficult to rule out troubled family dynamics and possibly abuse as contributing factors. My mother came of age when career options for women were beginning to open up. Most girls either became nurses or teachers if you were lucky enough and rich enough to acquire a profession. Um, the next thing was some sort of office work. And back in those days, there were still a lot of factories in this area. So a lot of the girls just went to work in a factory. Betty and I both had our hearts somehow. We both had our hearts set on that nursing, and she just got there a little bit ahead of me. But we, we both ended up doing it. With financial help from Agnes, Mom was able to enter a 15-month program to become a licensed practical nurse. She loved her profession and excelled at it. Her job was everything. I mean, it really was. She worked nights partly because nights worked her schedule. She could be home with, with you girls. Um, I think she had a, a lot of friends that worked with her. When she was at Hanneman, I mean, she was, yeah, her job was everything. But women like my mother were expected to do it all fulfill the traditional duties of wife and mother while building their careers. And research suggests that the pressure and guilt they felt increased their risk for drinking. I thought between keeping the house and working and raising a child, I thought she had a pretty full plate. It was more than a lot of girls at that time did. Um, she seemed to take it in stride, though. She, she never complained about it all. Um, I think sometimes when you're young and you have a career, it, it gives you an identity that just being a homemaker and a mom doesn't. Research also suggests that women who face unwanted changes in their life roles are at higher risk for drinking even today. These changes include marrying, divorcing, becoming a parent, facing an empty nest, and starting or stopping work against one's wishes. Here too, my mother's experience supports the research. While she was in nursing school, she met my father and within months was pregnant. Under pressure from their families, they reluctantly married. I was born three months after my mother finished her nursing program and just three weeks after she turned 19. If awareness had been what it is today, my mother would probably have been diagnosed with postpartum depression. Although she loved me, the first time she held me, she was seized with panic and burst into tears. Her family and in-laws helped out, but like many new mothers, she was overwhelmed by caring for an infant. To make matters worse, I did not feed well and was fussy. After one particularly exhausting night, when I was just weeks old, she slapped me and left a handprint on my face. She felt horrified and ashamed, but unfortunately, she frequently lost control and hit me when she got overstressed. Just before I turned four, my mother got pregnant with my sister. She was deeply ambivalent about the pregnancy. 
She considered having another child when she was better established, but her marriage was failing. Of course, mom treasured Chris, too, but having a second baby raised her stress level even higher. More than once, she was reported to social services on suspicions of abuse against us girls. Mom's sense of failure as a wife and mother were heightened by the social setting. In our conservative, small town, even in the 1970s, traditional gender roles remained strongly the norm, especially within my father's deeply religious family. She came in as an 18-year-old who was pregnant, and everybody knew everything, so it was everyone knew she was pregnant. So she came in feeling a lot of stigma. And the church... If you didn't conform exactly to the theology and really beyond the theology, even I think the social expectations, it was very uncomfortable. It was so much pressure on her to be the, uh, to be a good mother to us and to encourage and nurture us in a church that she just felt so oppressed by. You know, they were like one of the, the well, probably the only divorced couple or even going to get divorced couple in that church. And I think she felt like she was excommunicated from the church. And I don't think that really bothered her so much as, I don't think she liked being the first. I don't think she liked being the only Dutch marriage that failed. If the church's treatment alienated mom from organized religion, it not only put her under immense strain that contributed to her drinking, but also may have robbed her of a protective factor against alcoholism. Studies indicate that women who participate in religious activities and hold strong spiritual values are less likely to abuse substances than women who do not. Mental illness is another major risk factor for alcoholism, especially for women. Twice as many women as men receive a dual diagnosis of mental illness and addiction. The connection between depression and alcoholism seems especially strong. Women who suffer depression are three to six times more likely to develop alcoholism than women without depression. Stress is also a major risk factor. Significantly more women than men report drinking to alleviate stress and emotional pain. My mother was stressed, anxious, and depressed for decades although she was not formally diagnosed until near the end of her life, and even then refused medication and therapy. Certainly, she was under tremendous stress when she filed for divorce from my father in the early 1970s. With nowhere else to turn, Mom reluctantly asked my grandparents if we could stay with them until the divorce was over. Hoping to pressure her into reconciling with her husband, they refused when we were staying with different relatives and mom had you staying with an aunt and an uncle and I, mom and I stayed at grandma's and we didn't want to be any one place too long and we're at our welcome and we were being shuffled around a lot. Near the beginning of the school year, my grandparents relented and allowed us to move in. She had her own bedroom in the attic and I would go up there and hang out with her sometimes when she got home from work, but she would talk about when we go back home, we're going to go back home. We're going to move back home. And I knew it was important to her that we move back home. And she felt all the responsibility was on her. She had to work. She didn't have a choice. How am I going to work and bring up the kids and do the things that I need to do the way I want to do them? Women didn't make it on their own, not, not normally. Her idea of a handout was living with grandma and grandpa for a short period of time, moving back into her house and paying off that mortgage. That was her, her agenda. She was going to bring up you girls her own way, with her own money, and so you may do with a lot less than somebody else would. She needed to prove that she could do that as a woman and as a single woman. Eventually, we returned to the house. Mom's stress diminished some, but she was a young, single mother with two children to raise and hefty bills to pay. 
She frequently worked overtime and took second jobs to make ends meet. She was always exhausted and worried about money and used prescription medications and alcohol to cope. No, she never had a problem. That's the difference, you know? She never thought she had a problem, and I don't think I was smart enough to know that she did. I think that was one of the hardest things for me always, too, the feeling that Johnny Walker or Canadian mm -hmm. Club meant more to her than we did. Did. Yet, in some ways, the 1970s were good for her. She was stunning. She recovered her sense of fun, and she started dating again and going out to drink and dance. Unfortunately, the good times didn't last for long. It's hard to pinpoint when the balance shifted, but it may have been when my grandfather got cancer in the late 1970s. We did go to the hospital to visit him quite a bit. And the day that Grandpa died, I came home from school. And she was laying on the couch, sobbing. And I ran over to her. I said, Mommy, what, what's wrong? And she said, Grandpa's gone. And she was inconsolable for days. Mom drank more and more heavily. I remember when he died, too. We were working together, and she came into work probably a couple days afterwards. I don't remember now. And we all knew she had been drinking that day. Even the supervisors knew that, and, and she tried so hard to work that night. But it, had, it was such a loss to her that she just couldn't face it without the alcohol, even though she knew she couldn't work with drinking studies indicate that women are more influenced by the drinking of their peers and partners than men are as a result women with alcoholic husbands are more likely to become alcoholics themselves than men with alcoholic wives approximately nine out of ten women stay with alcoholic men but nine out of ten men leave alcoholic women Following treatment, women who socialize with friends who drink or stay with partners who drink are more likely to relapse. My mother and father, unhappily married and stressed by parenting, both drank to cope. In the late 1970s, mom got involved with Paul, who drank heavily and abused painkillers. Through the 1980s, she dated Jim, my guess is she probably met him through the package store that he worked or that he owned, and she would go in there. And I'm sure the relationship began that way. His gift to her every time he had a date was a bottle of booze. And um, if I remember correctly, it was a fifth of whiskey. You know, it came with the package. In the years she dated Paul and Jim, mom's drinking escalated and her relationships deteriorated badly. On the weekends that my sister and I spent with dad, mom parked her car behind the house, drew the shades, took the phone off the hook, and binge drank. She also drank most mornings. For years, she had worked nights and taken a sleeping pill when she clocked out. But she became plagued by insomnia and added a second pill. She started washing the pills down with a stiff drink, then two and became physically dependent on alcohol. As mom descended further into alcoholism, I found it impossible to live with her. I moved out in 1980 at the age of 15. Although I lived with my father just down the street and visited mom every week, my sister reports that mom took my move as another loss and source of shame and drank even more. I came in the house and mom was passed out on the floor uh, in a pool of vomit. I thought she was dead. Um, and I, I'm not sure. I was torn. I didn't know if I was relieved or terrified to find her that way, to find her dead. 
In 1983, my sister moved out too. She was told that she needed to have some help. And she agreed to go to a place up in New Hampshire because she didn't want to go any place around here where she knew anybody. And she went up there. And it was extremely hard for her to do. She called me and asked me to come over one day. And she said, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. It's the first time I'd ever heard her say it. And she said, I lost your, you know, your sister's moved out and she's gone and you've moved out. I don't want to lose my family and I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to a program and stop drinking and come home and get myself together. And I want you to come back home because I want to be your mom and I just miss you so much. She wanted so badly to turn her life around at that point. She was gone a long time. It felt like a long time. I was at college, so I don't know much about my mother's stay at Beach Hill, a private detoxification hospital in rural New Hampshire, except that her blood work revealed that she already had irreversible liver damage from drinking. And unfortunately, I think by the time she was really willing to try or thought she needed to try, it was probably too late for her. Maybe if she had tried earlier, things would have been different. I don't know. I was so glad she was going to get clean and come home. And I was going to get my mommy back the way I loved her when I did when I was four. And I happened to be at her house getting everything ready the night she came home. And uh, she walked in the house and um, Chris and she came over to me and I went running to her and to give her a big hug I was so happy and she put her purse down on the table and there was half a bottle of whiskey in it and she was drunk um I just I felt like it's over. My childhood's over. She's never going to be my mom. And the booze is always going to be more important. And I just, I felt, I felt so alone. I felt so alone. To 90% of the women who need treatment for alcoholism do not get it. Those who do tend to delay seeking it longer than men. Women are less likely than men to relapse in the first year following treatment, but more likely to relapse within five years. These dismal statistics help explain why alcoholic women are twice as likely to die from drinking as alcoholic men. Barriers that prevent women from seeking treatment include denial, fear of losing custody of children or admitting to an addiction, difficulty finding childcare while in treatment, fear of losing paychecks or even a job while in treatment, lack of health coverage, and stigma, guilt, and shame, which remains stronger for alcoholic women than men to this day. Being a woman alcoholic was probably looked upon as being very disgraceful. Somehow, men were given a little more leniency towards that, but for a woman, it was very disgraceful. And I think there was, a, certainly there was a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. It must have been a lot harder to ask for help if you needed it. My mother was able to overcome all of these barriers, except her guilt and shame and I believe that she became trapped by them. She said that she was a model patient at Beach Hill, and I believe her. Until her death, she freely admitted that she was an alcoholic. But in the coming years, she attended Alcoholics Anonymous only sporadically. And except for the weeks she spent at Beach Hill, she never stopped drinking completely. I don't understand why mom did not 
or could not stop drinking. Perhaps she didn't know herself. She may have thought that detox had broken her physical dependence on alcohol and that she would be able to keep her drinking under control and not become dependent again. If so, she was wrong. Because mom never forgave her mother. And she knew she was at least as bad, if not worse. Mom felt great guilt. I believe she felt we would never forgive her and that our relationship with her would never be healed. Mm. And it was easier for her to be drunk than to face how she had, the choices she had made and how she had lived her life. Although she continued to binge drink on her days off, mom's quality of life improved in the 1990s. She left the hospital where she had worked nights for more than 20 years and took a nine to five job in a medical clinic. Working a conventional Monday through Friday schedule suited mom. She slept better and gave up sleeping pills. She spent weekends with auntie on Cape Cod and with me in Western Massachusetts. For the first time in her career, she had holidays off and spent them with family and friends. When my sister got married and pregnant, she and mom grew close again. Mom witnessed the birth of her first grandchild in 1990 and was absolutely smitten with her. When my sister's husband was transferred to Texas, mom missed them, but she and I went to visit. Mom even paid off her mortgage and for the first time in her life was not under financial pressure. But by the end of the decade, things began to fall apart again. Mom faced a new round of stressors, ones common to aging women, isolation, health problems, stress from caring for aging family members, and bereavement. She fell into a deep depression. I think, too, um, depression must play a very large part of that. Loneliness, depression. Depression is a very... I know as a nurse, I've seen depression, and it's a horrible, sneaky, nasty thing. Depression and anxiety are especially significant risk factors for older women developing alcoholism or relapsing from sobriety. Drinking and depression form a vicious cycle. Depression contributes to alcoholism, and in time, alcoholism contributes to depression. In the general population, Twice as many older women suffer depression as older men. Amongst alcoholics, four times as many older women suffer depression as older men. For mom, trouble began when things changed at work. She had been very happy in her day job, but she assisted a doctor and he moved to a different site. She moved with him and that she didn't get along so well with her co-workers there, so her job was um, not satisfying to her anymore. Reluctantly, she resigned and took a job working nights in the dementia unit of a long-term care facility. Although she stayed off of sleeping pills, she resumed drinking in the morning. One day, in the summer of 2000, she ran out of alcohol and drove to the liquor store to purchase more. On the way home, she was stopped and arrested for drunk driving and lost her license for three months. Things started to go downhill again in the late 90s, and I think it was because Auntie Lois, uh, who mom really considered her own mother, who lived at the Cape, uh, really went through a major decline. By the summer of 2001, she could no longer live alone. Mom quit her job and moved in with Auntie. She made the decision out of deep love. And mom was terrified of losing her and being without her. Mom had always thought she would be auntie's caretaker, and she really found it stressful to deal with the social workers and the uh, visiting nurses and to have to take on that role. Auntie passed away in her own bed in July of 2001 with mom at her side. Mom had been distressed at Auntie's decline, but was devastated by her death. She immediately withdrew and started to drink heavily. 
and then she started becoming much more quiet and almost started that's when she started alien well pushing people away and not really being involved in people's lives and not letting people be involved in hers i didn't have a relationship with mom from 01 to 07 i saw mom in july of 2001 i never talked to her again after that she never called me at the end it was very hard to see her or talk to her and not be able to see her because she didn't want to see anyone unable to relieve or tolerate her raw grief my mother spiraled into an incapacitating depression as she reported to her doctor she could not sleep she could not eat she could not work she had frequent panic attacks and could barely force herself to leave the house. When she lost the contact with the nursing, she just went downhill a lot faster. She just wasn't stupid. She knew she had to have known what was happening. She had to have known where it was leading to. I don't think she cared. I'm sure, I'm sure a point came where she didn't care. But I have to believe until that point, she probably wanted some sort of help but couldn't ask for it. I just feel bad that she had isolated herself at the end. Yeah. We had gone through so much together. She was there for me, and I couldn't be there for her because she wouldn't let me. Although we talked on the phone occasionally, I saw my mother only once between 2001 and 2007. Following the birth of my daughter in 2003, we visited for about an hour. I was on the verge of tears while I watched mom cuddle and play with her granddaughter, hoping desperately that she would seek treatment for depression and alcoholism and re-enter life, but she didn't. She never met her grandson, who was born in 2005. She was simply unable to physically and emotionally. She was in the end stages of alcoholism and I finally grasped the all-encompassing nature of her addiction. I also understood that the difficulties in our relationship, especially following Auntie's death, were the inevitable result of her disease process. And she said, I drink, but that's never going to be me. And unfortunately, in the end, it was. At least by the time Mom died in September of 2007, our reconciliation was as complete as I could have hoped, given her profound physical and mental deterioration. I'm grateful for the peace we found. However imperfect, it helped me endure the excruciating aftermath of her death. Alcohol took everything from mom. She lost her family. She lost her friends. She lost her career. She lost herself. Ultimately, she lost her life to it. And theres it's more than just what mom lost because, you know, her parents lost a daughter. Her beloved sister lost her sister. We lost our mother. Our children lost out on their grandmother. And mom had a huge circle of friends earlier in life. And a lot of people lost out on a very kind very fun, compassionate friend. Mom's alcoholism was entwined with her genetic makeup, mental state, environment, and life experiences. It became part of who she was. Yet my sister and I wonder what might have been if she had not become an alcoholic or if she had gotten sober. She's never had a mother-daughter relationship with her children as adults she's not had a relationship with her grandkids why didn't she just move on 
but that really wasn't her at the end. And you have to remember the good things. And since she died and I've become reacquainted with her, I do miss her. I miss her more. I do feel like finally our relationship is healed, you know? And I just wish it could have happened in life. But I'm glad it's happening now instead of never. Instead of never. When I think back of, the, of how carefree and happy and young and naive and innocent we were, to go back and have a day like that again with her would just be absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. My sister and I call mom an accidental feminist. She lived life on her own terms, for better and worse. She pursued a profession she loved, derived satisfaction from her work, and supported herself and her children largely on her own. She divorced when her marriage went bad and never remarried, even though her life might have been easier if she had. She urged us not to marry or have children until we were ready, and then not to lose our own identities to the roles of wife and mother. She encouraged us to make the most of our youth and to enjoy life. I attribute my decision to pursue my doctorate in English and become a professor to her example. I also love my work, and my life would be greatly impoverished without it. My sister credits mom for her own determination to provide for her daughter when she became a single parent by working physically demanding jobs held by few women to this day. Mom also taught us our family history. She told us Agnes's stories about her youth in Scotland and voyage to America. When she drove her grandfather to the cemetery to visit his wife's grave, she brought us along. She fostered our relationships with extended family members, especially uncle and auntie. She also passed along her irreverent sense of humor, her soft spot for wounded animals, and her delight in everyday wonders. Despite all that happened, we love our mom, we thank her, and we miss her. (laughs) 